Okay, now we are recording. So I'll go over here and full screen. You still see? Okay, I can't hear you, but uh, it sounds like you Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> yes, oh, you I can. Those. Okay, good. All right, so I'm going to present this from the top. So I'll just pretend that this is a fresh audience that uh, hasn't seen any of this before, and I'll just start from step zero. So today I'd like to tell you about one of the most interesting developments in theoretical physics in the past 50 years, which is the renormalization group. And this is going to connect with some ideas about fractals, how phases change, and why science as a whole works as an intellectual enterprise. Okay. So what is our goal? The question we're going to try to address in this talk is how to understand science across length scales. So on the right side here, there's a bunch of different slices of objects we study in science from very small objects at the top from the quantum ether, if you will, to atoms, molecules, the earth, planets, and galaxies. So these phenomena that science attempts to study goes across many orders of magnitude. I'll use this term for uh, roughly the power of 10 that appears when one measures, say, lengths associated with some scale. So science measures things from very small objects at the top that are at the order of like 10 to the minus 20 meters or something up to the entire galaxy, which get entire galaxies or universes, which are at the orders of 10 to the 30 or more meters. So this is going to be our big picture goal to understand how science works across all of these different length scales. And the plan for how to do that is going to come in three parts. So in the first part, we'll start thinking a little bit about what we mean by science across length scales. In the second act, I'll give you a specific example, which is very near to my heart as a physicist, which is the charge of the electron and how it renormalizes. And in act three, we'll connect this with some ideas from condensed matter and statistical physics, including phase transitions and fractals. So that will be the plan. Let's start with some general comments on science across length scales, broadly speaking. So to warm up a little bit, um, I'll ask you to think a little bit and come up with two different objects that we study in science and try to estimate the size of those objects to within the nearest order of magnitude. So for instance, one example would be the objects that we studied or that we saw in this, uh, this right slider here. One object you might pick is something like the Earth. The Earth is something like, I think, six times 10 to the six meters, if I remember the radius of the Earth correctly. So that would be one example. Um, but can you think of two different objects we study in science that differ um, by a large number of orders of magnitude? Okay, I could try and challenge myself here. I'll do two things that I'm not very sure about. Okay. Um, I'll do the size of an electron and the size of a galaxy. Cool. Okay. Electron and galaxy. So what is your estimate for the length scale associated with the size of an electron? I'm going to guess that the electron is 10 to the minus 20. They're extraordinarily small. So indeed, electrons are modeled as point particles in our current understanding of particle physics. But you can get a rough approximation for the size associated with an electron. Let me see, approximate, let's do this, approximate electron radius. So. In quantum mechanics, there's a way to estimate uh, this. This is for the hydrogen. Okay, does the, does the electron have a radius? This is probably going to say no. Um, but it's going to, I'm trying to find the approximate radius. Here we go, okay, good. So there's an approximate estimate for the radius of the electron, which is turns out to be around 10 to the minus 18, right? So if you say 10 oh, to the okay. minus 20. Oh, that's not too bad, that's a. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a quite good estimate. Um, and indeed, this is, this is a very small bound uh, because we don't actually know the substructure of an electron. It could be exactly point-like. It could have no radius, but um, good. Okay. How about the size of a galaxy? Can you estimate the size of a galaxy? That one's going to be a lot harder for me because I'm really bad at estimating, but I'm going to guess a galaxy is maybe in the order of magnitude of 10 to the power of, I don't know, 18? Yeah, that, sounds, that sounds reasonable. So that's like um, over a billion Earth radii or something, which, okay, that sounds, that sounds like a, reason, a reasonable estimate. So we're in this range. The problem is, I guess, a galaxy 
spans many different orders of magnitude. So this is a difference of already two orders of magnitude in sizes in, of different galaxies. But let's say convert 300 light years to meters for a lower bound. That's around two times hey, 10 to the 18. Hey, look at that. Very good. <laughs> so your estimate was right pretty much on point for the upper limit when they said 300,000 light years. Or the lower. Oh, did you say 18? Did I say 18 or 20? Now I already I, forget, but it was one of those. <laughs> yeah. Both of them are within the acceptable range. Either way, I was in the bounds. I was on one of the bounds, so. Yes, very good. OK, so that's kind of fun. That's uh, two objects that, that uh, differ by a large number of orders of magnitude. Certainly, an electron in the galaxy are um, pretty close to the extreme limits of the things that we study. So here are other things you could have said if you were giving different answers. So. Um, close to your electron radius is roughly the size of a nucleon, like a quark, some subatomic particle. So 10 to the 15 is pretty close to the you know, 10 to the minus 18, 19 for the uh, approximate electron radius. And the galaxy up here, interestingly, the figure that I wrote down doesn't actually give a number for the galaxy, but we now know that it's around 10 to the 18 or 10 <laughs> to the 20. Very good. So those are some things you could say. And this game that we what just played. What was that on the on the slide? What was that about time? Because you also have you have length, but you also have time there. Yeah. Can true. you like so, measure length and time? Or? You actually can. So we were actually measuring length in terms of time a moment ago when we spoke about three thousand oh, light years, that. right? So you can always convert length measurements to time measurements using the speed of light. Um, on the right side here, they're not always doing that in this figure, but they're talking about different phenomena that vary substantially, they change substantially over a certain characteristic time scale. Um, so for instance, uh, a spin wave is some propagating degree of freedom in say a, a solid, a collection of spins or something, and it moves very fast. It only takes 10 to the minus 12 seconds for this thing to change appreciably. Um, so you can oh. indeed think of smaller and smaller length scales as being associated with smaller and smaller time scales. Very good. Okay. Other comments about this little game that we just did about estimating different orders of magnitude for things. So to make sure I understand correctly, you're saying like as you get lower and lower length scales, you also like does that correspond to lower and lower time scales? Like something really small is going to take also like a very small amount of time to do a certain action? Typically that's true because smaller objects uh, will tend to very substantially, change substantially over shorter time scales. So for instance, in the nucleus, these uh, quarks are bouncing around and being connected by gluons in a way that uh, roughly, I mean, it's, it's really roughly uh, one to one in the length scale and the time scale for those nuclear processes. So the length scale associated with those nucleons is about 10 to the minus 15 meters. And they bounce around where you see differences in say Compton scattering um, around the, tame, the same length uh, time scale. So around 10 to the minus 15 seconds. So as a rough approximation, if you just kind of convert you know, the, the same order of magnitude from uh, meters to seconds, you'll often get a good approximation for processes that uh, occur at that length scale. But that's, of course, not always true. So you can have macroscopic processes that um, are either very slow or very fast. So the mapping isn't exact, but typically smaller things do have uh, both you know, smaller length scales and smaller time scales. Good. OK, that makes sense. Very nice. Other thoughts on this? Nope. Okay. So as a brief side, that little game that we just played is something uh, that's associated with Enrico Fermi, who's, uh, for whom the institute where I work is named the Enrico Fermi Institute. So that little game you played where you estimated, say, the radius of the electron or the size of a galaxy is called a Fermi problem, or an order of magnitude estimate. And Fermi was famous for this. In many instances, he would play order of magnitude estimation games. But the most famous was when he was viewing the nuclear bomb test, the Trinity test. And he wanted to estimate the amount of energy released by this atomic bomb to within an order of magnitude. And by combining a few estimates, like dropping some pieces of paper and seeing how far they move, and then feeling you know, the warmth of the sun versus the warmth of the light from the explosion on his body, he came up with this order of magnitude estimate of 10 kilotons, which was within a factor of two of the true value. Um, so in these sorts of games, when you're playing Fermi games, if you're within one order of magnitude, you sort of won. So even though his estimate was you know, half of the true value, it's within an order of magnitude. And that's quite impressive for an estimate of an amount of energy that's using only very uh, approximate you know, data, like how far papers move and things like that. So this is a very useful skill. Yeah, that's like wild. 
Yeah, I mean, he's, he was very good at this. There's a reason why the Enrico Fermi Institute is named after him. <laughs> he was uh, mm -hmm. one of the, the last great physicists who was both good at experiment and at theory. Um, it's not, I am not good at experiment. Um, uh -huh. Okay, so now that we've thought a little bit about different scales, let's come to the real question of the talk. So the way I motivate this when I'm talking to uh, students who haven't heard about the subject before is to draw this contrast where I say, for instance, in math, you always need to learn simpler op operations before building up more complicated operations. So one learns to add before you learn your times tables before doing algebra. But in science, it seems that we go the opposite. So you learn biology, which is uh, studying big complicated objects, collections of cells bouncing around and things like that. And then maybe chemistry where you learn about water made up of molecules and atoms. And then later in physics and eventually in graduate school, if you go on, you learn about the nucleus, neutrons and protons and quarks. So if we were kind of comparing math and science, you might say, why can we go in the opposite direction in science? Why is it possible to understand the big picture, the glass of water, without first knowing all of the basic building blocks, the quarks that make it up? So you can ask this question. But of course, if I ask you that question now, you'll, you'll say, OK, Christian, you're pulling my leg a little bit. That's kind of a silly question, right? Because how could the behavior of these quarks possibly matter for understanding a glass of water, right? I don't really care if I'm a chemist looking at water. I don't care what the quarks are doing because I know that they're going to form, you know, something. The quarks are going to form some sort of stable object um, and kind of settle down into, you know, a big conglomerate when you have a huge bucket of quarks. So if they do that, I can just study the conglomerate. I can forget about the details of the quarks because I just care about the water. So this is kind of like the naive answer, but despite being naive, it's actually quite deep. So as we'll see in a little bit, this obvious sort of answer when expanded upon leads to some deep ideas in physics, which I said on the title slide, namely universality and the renormalization. Um, so to see what those mean, I just want to give two quick examples about uh, studying the same system at different levels of granularity or different scales. Uh, so one example would be air in a box. So this is a classic you know, chemistry, ideal gas type question. Um, how do you characterize the behavior of a bunch of molecules bouncing around in a box? So I just want to contrast two different length scales. If you're at a very short length scale, or appropriately, uh, accordingly, a very short time scale, right? To describe fully what the system is doing on the short length scales and short time scales, you have to tell me where every single molecule is, what it's doing, as in like the direction it's moving and how fast it's moving, what kind of molecule it is. So that has a huge amount of complexity. But if we study the same system at long length scales, you can forget about most of that complexity because you don't care what all of the individual molecules are doing. You just care about the averages, right? So for instance, the average speed of all of these molecules tells you the temperature and the average force and frequency with which they bounce off the walls of your box tell you the pressure. So you can go from a very detailed description at short length scales to a less detailed description at long length scales. So another classic example is uh, a magnet. So if we just uh, kind of simplify and think of a magnet as a collection of spins that can point up or down. So I'll put the down spins with this brown color and the up spins with the gray color. Um, again, you could have a very detailed fine grain description where you have each individual, say nucleus, for instance, if this is a bunch of iron nuclei or something that spins, each individual nucleus or atom or what have you, and know all of their spins. Or you can say, okay, well, I'm a human, so I can't see individual nuclei or atoms. I only see average spins. So what you could do is collect these guys into groups. Like you could, for instance, uh, box four of these guys together and do what, I, what I'll call flowing down the RG, which means going to longer length scales by averaging the guys in a box and replacing them with a big spin. So it's kind of blurring together all of the spins into one bigger spin. And you could imagine doing that again and going to even longer length scales, where now we just have four giant spins. So this is another example of going from the short granular procedure to the longer uh, coarser, longer range coarser procedure. So then with a magnet, does it just work where with the, it just works in one way, which is the average of all of the spins? Um, but it works in one way. You mean going, you can only go in one direction. You can go from the, sh the short range to the, the long range description. I mean like the way like a magnet works, like, how it like has like the attraction and everything. It only does it like based on the average. 
So a macroscopic magnet, sure. So if you have a, a physical magnet with a north and a south pole, it's, it is of course made up of a large number of small spins, but those spins will be collected into what are called magnetic domains. A magnetic domain is a huge number of individual spins that are not all pointing in the same direction, but they have some average magnetization, like this big downspin. So indeed, yeah, a big magnet you could think of, like a big physical magnet that you can hold in your hand is something that has like maybe a North Pole and a South Pole where the North Pole has a net magnetization of one direction and the South Pole has a net magnetization of another direction. That's me. Okay. Good. All right. So let me, now that we have a couple ideas about what it means to flow uh, along this renormalization group, let me just summarize what I want to make more precise in the next part. Um, so what we've seen is that both in the gas case and in the spin case, if you know the detailed description, if you know everything that's going on for a system at small length scales, you can always average to go to longer length scales. So I'll call that flowing down the renormalization group. Typically, you cannot go the other way. So if you only know the averages, like the temperature and pressure of the gas, you can't figure out the coarse or the fine grain details. You can't figure out where all of the atoms or molecules are and the direction that they're going in, right? Because this averaging procedure loses information, right? It destroys information, which you can't recover. But yeah. The yeah, good. Um, but the point that I want to, to emphasize is that uh, in many real world physics cases, this is not such a big deal because you can often have many different short distance theories that will look the same at long distances. So for instance, if I take a gas that's at a particular temperature and you know, freeze it and take a picture of it and look at where all of the atoms and molecules are, atoms or molecules are at a particular time, um, they'll all have some complicated speeds and positions. Um, but now if I wait a couple seconds and take another picture, say it's a bunch of oxygen and nitrogen molecules, um, there'll be a very different collection of locations and speeds because they've moved, but the temperature is still the same. The average is still the same. So you can have many different short distance theories that look the same at long distances. Um, they're said to be in the same universality class. Well, um, well, so if those like, if those short distance theories look the same as long distances, then why is it that some scientists study, like you study like neutrinos and all those like super small fundamental particles, if instead you could just look at the bigger molecules yeah, good. So that's um, indeed, it's a question of taste, right? So if you're, if you're interested in questions about the macro scale structure, say like the universe, if you're a cosmologist, then you probably uh, won't care as much about short distance behaviors, right? You, cosmologists typically model the universe as like being a completely homogeneous soup of matter that looks the same everywhere, more or less, because they don't care about the short distance behavior as much. Um, or if you're a chemist, you only care about, say, um, reaction mechanisms and you don't care about neutrinos for sure. Um, so you have to choose, when you become a scientist, you have to choose what type of phenomena are interesting to you. Um, so I choose to be interested in the shorter distance phenomena like fundamental particles, what electrons and neutrinos are doing uh, because that interests me. I want to know the most fundamental laws of the universe, but that's, um, that's your choice as a scientist to decide what you like and what you care about. So I understand that it's a matter of taste, but I feel like in point three, your C short distance theories look the same at long distances. So how come you just study the short distances instead of long distances? So you say, why, why do I personally want to study the short distance behavior or why would anyone? Like, why is that necessary if you can just look at them at the long distance cases, if they look the same? Yeah, true. So, uh, I mean, it's, you could ask, why is it necessary? Why do we build particle accelerators is one, one related question, right? You could say, why do we spend a huge amount of money to smash protons together and see what's inside to realize that protons are made of quarks? Um, you could, you could, you could, that's a totally valid criticism. You could say it's not necessary to smash protons together to see that they're made of quarks because we could just study the protons, right? The short distance behavior doesn't matter and we could just study the long distance behavior. And that's true, but if we only study the long distance behavior, then we only understand the long distance behavior, right? So uh, it's, it's uh, just a matter of scientific curiosity. If you want to know what's inside the proton, you need to look at shorter length scales to understand that it's made of quarks. If you don't care that it's made that of quarks, that's fine. Okay, good. All right. I have one code aside, but before I do that code aside, 
any questions about this big picture stuff about length scales? Nope. Okay. All right, let me pop over to Python quickly, which is not in our chat. Um, it's in this one. Okay. Okay. So for those that might be watching at home, um, I'm just going to run some Python code here that's going to set up our environment. And then I want to show one example related to this averaging procedure that we saw a moment ago, right? So if you imagine that these are spins again, or maybe the white are up pointing spins and the black are down pointing spins, that procedure that we just saw of grouping spins into blocks and then replacing them with averages um, is kind of represented by this grouping mechanism with an average vote uh, in these pictures. But I'd like to think about a slightly related problem where we don't have just up and down spins, we have a collection of numbers. So if I have a square collection of numbers like these four numbers, 0 0.2, 0 0.8, 0 0.1, and 0 0.5, we could do the same sort of block averaging procedure that we did up here by taking the average of those four numbers, which happens to be 0 0.4, and replacing that entire array with a two by two array of that average value. So the way you do that in Python here is creating that array, which I've written up here. This piece of code takes the average of the numbers in that array and uh, you know, stores it to this example average variable. And then this piece of code makes a new array whose pieces, whose entries are all equal to the average of the old one. So if I do that, I get a nice block array that's given by the average of those four numbers. Okay, so for a more interesting example, I'm gonna load in a big array of numbers that I've saved ahead of time. And you know, if you print it out, this is some big collection of, of numbers, the dot, dot, dot is skipping hundreds of rows and all of the numbers are between zero and one. So in this particular case, this represents a picture, a black and white picture where each number is a pixel that's somewhere between black and white. And if we look at that picture, uh, it happens to be a picture of the Jim Thorpe band director crossing his fingers, uh, hoping that the band does well uh, at their field show. So good for him. We have Eric P. Flowers here. Uh, but now I just to get to get a very intuitive picture of what this block averaging is doing. I just want to write a piece of code that does what we did before with this little array and averages over arrays in the Eric P. Flowers picture. So here's a quick piece of Python code that does that. Um, here is a function which takes in an array and a block size to average over. And what it does, it's going to collect some information about the array, like its height and width, make a new array, and then it's going to iterate over every x, y pair that gives you a pixel in the array. And then this piece of code is just finding the bounds, the right endpoint, the left endpoint, and the top and bottom endpoints of a subblock to average over. And then it's going to take that block that surrounds the pixel in question uh, and find the average of all of the, the numbers that are in that subblock. And then it's going to make a new, in the new array, it's going to replace all of the values in that block with their average. So this is going to go through and average over um, subblocks in the original picture. Uh, okay. All right, so it looks like you got kicked off for a second, but um, are you back now? Okay, not sure, not sure if you're back, but I guess I'll keep on going and then eventually the connection will stabilize. Um, but okay, good. So as an example of a piece of code that would use this, this function. What was that? Uh, oh, are you back? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so I'm about to run this code that averages over blocks in the Eric P. Flowers picture. Um, so do you have a prediction for what will happen when I average over 10 by 10 blocks in this picture and replace every pixel with its average over a 10 by 10 block. It will get pixelated here. Yeah, it should get grainy. So let's see that. If I do the pixelation. So indeed, replacing this by its average has pixelated the image, made it, made it coarser. This is flowing down the RG, if you like. Um, so you can always, as we were saying before, if you know the sharp picture, you can always make it more pixelated. 
but you can't go backwards. If I have the pixelated image, I can't be like, you know, one of these bad cop shows where they have a grainy image from a security camera and say enhance and it somehow becomes sharp. Uh, we can't do that. So a question for you, what would I change in this code block to instead average over bigger blocks, say 50 by 50? Change the 10 to a 50. Yeah, good. So this will average over larger blocks, which will make it, of course, even more grainy. So basically any image, if you flow far, far enough down the RG, it's going to become totally um, unrecognizable, which I guess you could say is that all of these images are in the same universality class, that they look the same if you zoom out far enough. Very good. All right, so now let's get to some physics that is a little more interesting, in my opinion. So this is the renormalization of the electron charge. Okay. So we said before that instead of thinking about going to short length scales, you can think of going to short time scales, but you can also think of that as going to high energy scales. Um, okay, so why is that? Uh, the reason is that to look at something, to resolve something with light, when you look at me, for instance, you bounce photons off of me and they're collected in your eye, but since I'm pretty large, I'm on this uh, length scale of like a meter or something like that, it's totally acceptable to bounce even visible light off of me. And uh, since the visible light has a wavelength that's much, much smaller than me, when you bounce it off of me, you can resolve the structure in, in my body by bouncing photons off of it because that wavelength is of an appropriate length. But you cannot use visible light to look at atoms, for instance. Right? Atoms or molecules are so small that the wavelength of the visible light is bigger than the object, so it can't possibly resolve the object. You can't see it. So to see something smaller, you need to use a shorter wavelength of light, which as we learn in uh, you know, chemistry or general science or whatever, um, a shorter wavelength of light corresponds to a higher energy, right? Higher frequency is higher energy. So in the rest of the talk, I'm going to interchangeably use flowing down the RG, which is going to long length scales with going to low energy scales, right? Because if you have a long length, a long wavelength, like in the infrared, that's lower energy. And a short length, like in the ultraviolet, is high energy. So I'll sometimes say flowing, instead of flowing down the RG, I'll say I flow to the IR, I flow to the infrared. Okay, that's a small aside. Now we can ask a real physics question. Um, how do the physical quantities in a theory that we like, like the theory of the interaction of light with matter, how do those physical quantities change when I change a length scale or an energy scale? So for instance, um, as, as you know, particles like electrons and protons have charge, right? So electric charge is really just telling you how strongly are these objects affected by photons? How strongly do they couple by photons? Couple two photons. So if you think of two protons sitting in space, they're going to repel by this electrostatic repulsion, but I want you to think of that force between them as really because these guys are throwing photons back and forth between each other, like kind of two people standing on rafts throwing a ball back and forth, and throwing that back and forth pushes them apart. So that photon exchange is going to cause these guys to repel. Okay, so that's a nice picture for how uh, charge leads to an interaction, but Here's an amazing result that physicists only understood within the past hundred years or so. Uh, the charge of an electron, or indeed even of a proton, is not a constant. It's not just some number. Uh, even though in chemistry you're told the electron charge has some particular value, um, it actually flows when you change the length scale, or equivalently the energy scale, that you're using to look at it. So the charge okay. of the electron, yeah, it's surprising, right? The charge of the electron is uh, length dependent. So let me make that slightly more precise. Uh, don't worry, this section is a bit more mathematical. So if you don't uh, get all the details, that's fine. Just try to extract the big picture. Um, but if you have any physical theory with a coupling constant G, by coupling constant, I mean a number that measures the strength of some interaction, like the electron charge, and you measure that coupling constant at an energy scale mu. So mu is some number that tells you the energy scale at which you're probing the dynamics of your system then there's some function which you can compute called the beta function. And the beta function tells you roughly how does that coupling constant change when you change the length scale. And there's a factor of mu here. So it's really mu times the derivative, dgd mu, if you know calculus. Um, 
So if you don't know calculus, you can just think of this in a slightly different way. You could just say, okay, well, if I measure that quantity like charge at a first uh, one scale mu, and then I change the scale by an amount d mu, then the coupling constant will change, and it will change in a way that's approximately the right side of this equation. This ratio d mu over mu times beta. Um, so I'm not going to tell you how to compute the beta function for the electron, because that's uh, a classic calculation you do in a quantum field theory course in physics graduate school. So um, I can't tell you how to compute this function. It requires some Feynman diagrams. But I can tell you the answer, and we can think a little bit about what it means. So the answer is the following. Um, when you make a particular approximation that simplifies the problem a little bit, a particular low energy approximation, you get a beta function for the charge E. So of course the electron's negatively charged, but I just want to talk about the absolute value of that charge, like the, the positive version. Um, the beta function in some units turns out to be E cubed over 12 pi squared. So what does that mean? Um, let's forget about all the units just to make the math a little simpler. So what this means is that if I measure the electron charge at some energy scale, say mu equals 100 in some units that I don't care about, and I crank up the energy by a little bit, by like 10 in those units, then the charge which I measure will change by a little bit. The change in the charge, dE, is roughly going to be this ratio d mu over mu, which is here 10 over 100, or about 10%, times e cubed over 12 pi squared. So to, just to approximate this, pi is about three, so pi squared is about nine, which is about 10. So this denominator is about a thousand. So if you increase the energy scale at which you look at the electron by 10%, then the charge is going to roughly, in some units, increase to the old charge plus the cube of the old charge over a thousand. So that's a small change, one part in a thousand. Um, and you might say, okay, how, are, how do these units make sense? You're adding something with charge to charge cubed, but I've thrown away all of the units. There's additional dimensional factors here that make the units make sense. But if we just forget the units, then this equation is correct. So if we just step back from the math for one moment, the punchline here is that the measured charge of the electron, the strength of its coupling to the photon, gets bigger. It increases if you measure it at higher energies. That's a remarkable result. The charge will change. Good. Comments or thoughts on this little conclusion? Nope, not yet. Okay. All right. Um, so let me just tell you one picture why we, or how we can understand why the charge should change, right? How can we think about this? So if you go on to take quantum field theory, you'll learn that in quantum mechanics, empty space is not actually empty. So if you go way out deep into space in the void, um, where there's no matter there, you're always going to have these, this constant soup, these pairs of electrons and their antimatter partners called anti-electrons, which are positively charged versions of the electron with the same mass. So in empty space, you have a constant collection of electron anti-electron pairs that pop out of nowhere and exist for a short time and then annihilate and go away. So the reason why the electron charge changes is the following. If you have a real physical electron, not a virtual pair of electrons and anti-electrons, a real physical electron sitting in space somewhere, there's a bunch of electron anti-electron pairs popping out of, out of nothing, out of thin air around it. Those virtual, which by which I mean the short-lived pairs that exist for a short period of time, those virtual pairs, while they're existing, they're going to spend more time close to the electron if it's the positively charged guy. The anti-electron is attracted to the electron. And they'll spend more time further from the electron if it's the negatively charged guy, because they're repelled. So all of those little virtual particles are going to cluster in this formation around the electron where the positive guys are the, on the inside and the negative guys are on the outside. But that positive charge close to the electron is screening the real electron charge. So the point is that what we think of as a physical electron is not just an electron. It's an electron dressed by this cloud of virtual particles around it, which screen the charge. And the reason for the renormalization is that if I try to measure this electron charge at low energies, so by low energies, maybe I mean I shoot a particle at this electron, maybe another electron at it, and I see how it's repelled. Um, at low energies, this 
probe electron that I shoot at it sees a screen charge, which is lower. But if I shoot in a particle well, high end, then yeah. with higher energies. Oh, sorry, you cut out at higher energies than what did you say? You see like the positive charge in it with it. Yeah, at higher energies, you kind of pierce the cloud is what you're what you're saying. So you see a more negative charge, right? So it's not screened. So the size of exactly good. Yeah. So if I shoot in a particle with high energy, it goes way in deep into this cloud and you see this unscreened charge, the bare yeah. charge, as we say. That's right. So yeah, the, the true electron charge is more negative than what we measured in the lab. Very good. Okay, so you could ask this question, okay, why did my chemistry teacher lie to me? Um, why do the textbooks lie to me? So why weren't we told that the electron charge is not actually a constant uh, when we studied chemistry, right? And the reason, as I think you realize by now, is that it's not relevant for chemistry, right? At long distances, again, at low energies, we can forget about this very complicated cloud of uh, electron, anti-electron pairs that are popping into existence. Just forget about it. Say, I don't care what's going on at that short distance. At long distances, I can replace that with a simpler approximate system. Now, the approximate system won't have the same numbers associated with it as the true system, by which I mean the charge that we, uh, that we use for the electron in this approximation, where you replace this with one object, that charge is lower than the true charge. So the numbers will change, but you can replace the system, the complicated version, with a simpler version by changing the numbers a little bit. Right? So sort of said differently, since chemistry is at low energies, we can pretend the charge is constant just by changing that, chance, that constant and then get away with it. Okay. Good. Okay. So this is more universality. What was that little physics bit at the bottom? Ah, so my, my jargon sentence here. Uh, so the term that we use for this in, uh, in statistical mechanics is you would say, the theory flows to an infrared fixed point. By infrared fixed point, I mean if you go in the deep infrared, which means low energies or long distances, then the theory approaches uh, something that becomes constant. It doesn't change anymore. Fixed point means something which no longer changes when you change the length scale. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, so I mean, if you go to long length scales, then it doesn't matter if I look at an electron from a meter away or a mile away, it's gonna look like it has the same charge, right? Um, it's only at short distances you see the difference. So that, that's what I mean by a fixed point. Good. Um, okay. Any questions about the electron comments before I do the last? That looks good. Okay. So I have another code aside for you if you have the time. So here's another example to motivate our last section. And this is a classic system to study, which you'll also study in your Python course, called a random walk. So if you just imagine like a little one molecule, like maybe a little molecule of dye that I drop into like a tube of water. Um, now the water molecules are jiggling around because they have some temperature. So just imagine that at each time step, the dye molecule gets knocked either to the left or to the right with equal probability, right? So if it starts here, uh, maybe it's going to get, uh, you know, knocked, well, it starts at zero, maybe it gets knocked initially to the right, it goes to one, then it goes to zero then minus one, then minus one, back to minus two, and then to the right goes to plus one. So it's just going back and forth with equal probabilities. Um, so we'll see why this is relevant for RG in a moment. But first we could just ask, how do I do this in Python? Right. So here's a little function. It takes in a number of steps that you wanna do. It's the number of times that the dye molecule is knocked around and the size of the steps. And then all I do is I use a for loop to say, uh, for each step in my random walk, I randomly choose using random.choice. I choose either minus one or one. I update my current position by adding that step, which is either minus one or one. And then I add the position to a list. Um, okay, so if I run this and print it out, you can probably guess what it's gonna look like. It's the same thing. It starts at zero, then goes to minus one, then back to zero, one, two, three, two, three. So it's just bouncing around and it has some position at each time. So just in words, if I were to plot this, if I wanted to graph where this guy was at each time, where his position is on the y-axis, what do you think that this graph would look like? So what is it graphing? Like, what are the axes? So the x-axis would be time. So each time step, um, he's at some position. And the y-axis is the position he's at at that time. So for instance, we'll have at zero, he's zero. At x equals one, he'll be at y equals minus one. 
x equals two is back at y equals zero. Yeah, so it's gonna kind of look like a piecewise function of a bunch of lines just going like up and down. Yeah, exactly. It's gonna be some jaggedy guy. Some jagged, exactly. So it's a bunch of piecewise lines just connecting where he is at each time. So these are just like, if you like, discontinuous jumps at each time step. Um, so next question, if I change the step size, so instead of jumping by one at each time, he only jumps by 0 0.01, what's gonna happen to this plot? What will it look like now in comparison to the original plot? It'll look less jaggedy because it's going to be smaller steps. Mm -hmm. So it'll look more like a single straighter line. Yeah, true. So it's going to look um, smoother, basically, right? So let's plot that. And indeed, okay, so here you can see huge discontinuous jumps. Here you can still see it's a little jagged, but it looks a little smoother. Right? Okay. Yeah. So now you could think about hypothetically taking the limit, which we can't do in Python, but we can think about mathematically. What if you take the limit as that step size goes to zero? Here it was 0 0.01. What if the step size went to zero? So that's saying it's kind of at each, you know, in each finite, you know, one second or something, it's taking infinitely many steps, but they're all infinitely small, if you like. That's not really precise, but um, that's roughly what's going on. Um, so that object that you get by taking that limit very small is something called a Brownian motion or a Wiener process. And as you can probably visualize, if I could show you a true Wiener process, which I will over here, this is a Wiener process here. This is that uh, kind of infinitely small random walk, right? So what I'm showing in this picture here is zooming in closer and closer on that infinitely small random walk. And because the step size is so small, it's going to zero, no matter how far you zoom in on a Wiener process, it still looks at like it's the same level of jaggediness, right? It's not quite the case that you zoom in and it looks like a copy of itself, but it remains jagged no matter how closely you zoom in. Where in contrast, if I look at one of these other random walks, if I zoom in very close to say this little region of the jumpy random walk, it'll look like a straight line, right? The jaggediness goes away. So that's something we're going to investigate in the last part. Okay, of so the first plot was not a fractal, but if you take the limit as zero, it is. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, so the limit as the step size goes to zero is a fractal. Yeah. And in particular, the fractal dimension of this guy is one and a half, um, 1.5, which is bigger than one, right? It's, a, it's roughly a line, and a line has dimension one. Um, so that's fine. Yeah. Good. Um, now I want to make one last comment before we're going back to the slides. So again, as is usual with the RG, the precise details of what's going on microscopically doesn't matter. So what do I mean doesn't matter? Let's do a different random walk. Here's a different random walk where instead of randomly picking either plus one or minus one at each time step, I use a bell curve. So all I've changed in this code is the step which before was taking a random choice. It's either taking one or minus one. In this new code, the step is taking any number in a bell curve, or sorry, this is a uniform distribution, sorry. So any number with equal probabilities between minus one and one. So this new random walk could jump by a step size of a half, of zero, of minus a quarter. This is just picking any number between minus one and one with equal probabilities and saying that's how far I'm gonna move at that time step. Um, okay, so you might think, well, that might be very different from the original random walk. The original random walk always went either up one or minus one. This guy can go change by zero, he can change by a half. Um, so you might think that this looks very different. And initially it does. So this guy, you can see some of the steps are small. You know, sometimes he jumps by a lot, sometimes he just jumps by not much at all. So this continuous random walk where I can take any step size between minus one and one does look different initially when I do you know, a small number of steps with a reasonable step size. Um, but if I zoom out, so to speak, by doing a larger number of steps and reducing the step size. So by reducing the step size, I mean, now I pick a random number between 0 0.001 and minus 0 0.001. If I zoom out, now it looks almost indistinguishable, right? This looks, I could not tell if you showed me this plot, whether it came from the continuous version or the jumpy version, right? So 
the point is that with a random walk, it actually doesn't matter how you choose the step size if you zoom out far enough, right? If you go to uh, longer and longer length scales, all random walks are going to look the same. They're all going to look fractal, and they're all going to have the same fractal dimension. Okay. Any questions on random walk or comments on random walk stuff before I wrap up the slides? Oh, did I lose you? Okay, well, I'm getting no audio, so I'll assume that means no comments, and I should go on with the. With the slides. Yeah, sorry. Ah, okay, no problem. Good. All right, last part. This I think will be very fun. Most relevant for I think what you want to work on. So Act Three is about these fractals and phase transitions. Okay. So in the last act, I told you that there's this thing called the beta function that tells you that my coupling constant, some physics thing, like an electron charge, changes by some amount when I change my length scale or my energy scale, in this case, an energy scale view. So you can ask, what happens if the beta function is zero? If the beta function is zero, then no matter what I multiply by it, this d mu over mu, I'm always still gonna get zero. So that means that if the beta function is zero, I can change the length scale and my coupling constant, the physics, the charge, does not change, right? So said differently, those words mean that if the beta function is zero, the system looks the same at every energy scale or equivalently all length scales. So if I zoom out, it looks exactly the same. So this might remind you of a classic example of other objects that if you look out, look, if you zoom out, they stay the same, or at least some of these objects have the property that if you zoom out, they stay the same, and that's fractals. So Many of the most popular examples of fractals, as you know, have this property that they're self-similar. So one is like the Mandelbrot set. If you kind of zoom in or zoom out on a part of the Mandelbrot set, it looks like a copy of itself. So such an object like a fractal is closely related to a place where the beta function is zero. And we call those places renormalization group fixed points. So a fractal is a renormalization group fixed point. But what are other examples that might be more relevant for physics, such fixed points? So I'll tell you another. Another is a phase transition. And this is perhaps the most interesting part. Um, often real world systems, physics systems, at such renormalization group fixed points exhibit critical behavior. So if you have boiling water and you zoom in closer and closer on the interface between the water and the air, you can kind of see that these bubbles have a structure similar to the Mandelbrot set. If you zoom in at the interface between some of these bubbles, you can see there's smaller bubbles forming here. So you might imagine that over some range of lengths, if I keep zooming in, the bubbles will look self-similar. And that's approximately true. That statement actually leads to some very powerful predictive structure about the behavior of boiling liquids. So one thing that you could do when you understand statistical mechanics is you can show that any liquid any liquid which is turning into a gas, it's boiling at some critical temperature, it's boiling point, it's going to have some scale invariant behavior. And in particular, you can show that the heat capacity, the heat capacity of such a boiling liquid is always blowing up. So this thing is going to infinity because this is one over T minus TC. So as T gets close to TC, the heat capacity is going to infinity. That should be intuitive to you because you know that when water is boiling, there's some, if you like, enthalpy of vaporization, which means that if you put in some energy, it doesn't actually change the temperature of the water because you need some of that heat just to boil it. So if you put in a little bit of energy and the temperature doesn't change, that means the heat capacity is infinity, right? Because you're dividing, um, you know, you put in the change in heat divided by the change in temperature, the temperature doesn't change, so it goes to infinity. But you can ask, okay, I know it goes to infinity, but how exactly does it go to infinity? What function is, is it that's blowing up? And amazingly, it's this function. It's always one over T minus TC to this specific power, which is roughly 0.11008. And that is the same for all liquid gas phase transitions. It's another example of universality. You could boil any liquid you want. Its heat capacity will always have this behavior near the boiling point. So this is another example of universality. That regardless of the short distance behavior, what liquid you're talking about, you get this um, totally generic behavior um, near the phase transition. So for our last example, and after this I'll, I'll let you go, um, one more example is this spin system that I told you about way at the beginning. Um, so I'll show you some Python for this. 
But first, let me explain what's going on. These pictures are more examples of those collections of spins that can point either up or down, right? So say white is up and black is down. But now, in addition to just allowing them to point up or down, I'm going to put in a wrinkle, make it a little more complicated, and say there's also a temperature. And there's two effects. There's two effects going on. All of the spins like to point in the same direction as spins nearby, right? So everyone wants to point in the same direction as their neighbors. But the temperature also in introduces some random thermal jiggling, some oscillations. So when the temperature is very low, the jiggling is very weak. So if the jiggling is weak, the dominant effect is the spins want to align. And each of the spins tends to be more or less the same as his neighbors, right? Here it's mostly black. At high temperatures, T bigger than the critical temperature, now the temperature is making everyone jiggle. It's very hard for these guys to align with their neighbors because they're jiggling so much and they always miss and keep going in a random direction. So at high temperatures, these guys are more or less random. It's not mostly aligned like black in a low temperature. It basically looks like TV static. Um, so that's the high temperature limit. But there's a critical temperature, which is a phase transition, in fact, just like the boiling water. At the critical temperature, there's a balancing between the tendency for these guys to misalign from temperature and the desire to align because they want to match their neighbors. And at that critical temperature, it's neither all going to one spin more or less, nor is it television static, but you get these islands where the spins are mostly aligned and then other domains where they're mostly aligned in the other direction. So let me show you a picture of what happens just to emphasize this point. Um, here's this other picture. Um, Here's those three cases where I took the, the spins from. And now I'm just going to show what happens as you zoom out. So I'm going to flow to the infrared or flow down the RG in all three of those cases. So first, in the low temperature case, as you'd expect, when I zoom out, since the spins are mostly all in the same direction, so they want to align, it eventually looks like it's just a solid spin that's all in the same direction. So you zoom out and it goes to white, right? On the other hand, if I zoom out in the high temperature guy, Eventually, since everyone's jiggling so much, eventually it's going to look totally random. It's just going to be television static, right? So I zoom out and it goes to static. But amazingly, at the critical temperature, if I zoom out and zoom out and zoom out, it never approaches either the same color or static. Because in fact, this is also a fractal. It's scale invariant. No matter how far you zoom out, you're still going to have islands where it's one spin and islands where it's the other spin. So this is another example of the scale invariant behavior. And in fact, we can do this in Python. So I'm not going to go through the details of this icing model simulation, um, although I might ask you to do it and to modify this code to take into account some other effects like a magnetic field or something. But I'll just quickly say some words. All this code is doing is making a grid of black and white spins like we had before. It has some famous algorithm, the Metropolis algorithm, for updating the spins. And that updating takes into effect the temperatures where these guys sometimes fail to align and also the preference for each spin to align with its neighbors. So it knows how to do that in some smart way. And then all I do at the end is uh, plt.show is just showing a picture at the end of where the spins are. Okay, so first I'll just run this for you at some temperature and show you what it does, which will I think take a couple of seconds because it's a bit slow. Um, but after this, maybe it's about 30 seconds. So maybe I'll just ask you to predict. So if the temperature is at like 1.354, um, would you predict that that temperature is in the regime where it's all aligned or the regime where it's a high temperature and it all goes to TV static or the critical point perhaps? I'm guessing all white. Oh, wait, okay, so that seems like a low temperature limit to you. Okay. Um, I forget how long this takes to run. While that's running, I will jump back to the slides, I guess, and ask if you have any, uh, com any final comments about any of the slides while we wait for that to finish. So what exactly is a renormalization group? Yeah, good. So um, the word is actually kind of confusing because the renormalization group is not actually a group in the mathematical sense. Uh, we discussed symmetry groups before. So it's a, for historical reasons, we still use the term renormalization group. But 
really by the phrase renormalization group, we're just referring to the collection of ideas that physical quantities look different at different energy scales or length scales. So for instance, you would call this the renormalization group equation to discuss how these things change as you change length scales. Um, but it's actually not a group, right? I mean, you know from your study of groups that, for instance, every group element has an inverse, right? If you do a symmetry, there's some other inverse that undoes the symmetry. Um, clearly, renormalization is not a group because if you float to long length scales, you can't invert that and go back to short length scales. Um, so it's not really a group. Um, but we use the word renormalization just for this process. Renormalization usually means you're just flowing to longer length scales. Good. Other comments? Okay. I think that's it. Sorry, didn't that video start? Ah, here we go. Okay. So here is the simulation in time um, for the icing model. So as you correctly predicted, so if we start at this temperature, which I randomly picked, 1.354, and then run this, uh, I started it at some random initial state, so where everyone was distributed randomly. And if you just wait over time, at this low temperature, all of these guys, and while I explain this, I'm going to start running this at a different temperature, just because I forgot how long this took. And I want to be able to uh, multitask a little bit. So I'm going to put in a slightly different number and then start running this. And then, OK, so let's just let's discuss what's going on here a little bit while that runs. Um, so all this code did was initialize all these spins in random directions, start updating them. And you can immediately see that already at time one, because we're at low temperatures, as you predicted, everybody is preferring to align with their neighbor, and they're not jostling around that much. right? So most of these guys are starting to form structure. They're getting patterns. And as we go further and further to time four, say for instance at time four, we have larger islands. And at time, say 32, now we're getting big, big magnetic domains. So this is like your question at the beginning when you were asking um, in a physical magnet, um, what's going on? In a physical magnet, you have domains that look roughly like this picture, say at time 32, where you have big collections of spins that are mostly aligned. And then there's, these are called domain walls. Domain walls are the interfaces between two different regions that have mostly different spins. But your prediction was correct. As we go to time 100 or 1,000, at time 1,000, this guy has basically all gone to spins in one direction, where red, I think, is up, perhaps, like white. So indeed, at the low temperature regime, exactly as we saw on the slides, um, zooming out is eventually going to lead to some uh, basically homogeneous set of spins that are all pointing in the same direction. And as a brief side remark, maybe I'll just show you what magnetic domains are. So magnetic domains are these islands. Wikipedia will probably have a better picture of it. Yeah, good. So this will put a bit more color onto the question you asked before. Um, where was that picture? I wanted? Maybe it was on Google Images. Yeah, this is basically the picture that I want, something like this. Um, so if you look at a physical magnet, like a, um, a just a north-south pole, uh, the way that you can play with in, in everyday life. So this is some object that has net magnetization that's flowing around it in this you know, kind of circular way. But what's going on microscopically is that if you look very closely at the magnet, there's domains where the spins are mostly pointing in a particular direction. So if you zoom in even closer, it might look like this where there's collections like this big jagged collection of spins that are all pointing mostly up. And then maybe there's some other collection of spins here that are mostly pointing in one direction. So those magnetic domains are what gives the net magnetization that causes physical magnets to have their physical properties, right? Um, they're just big buckets of spins that have some preferred alignment in some direction. Okay, and then to conclude the talk, I put in here this temperature, this very, specific temperature that I happen to know, which is the critical temperature for the icing model. And as a challenge to you, you might think about how could you, could you compute this? So there's several ways to compute this. You could use Python to just kind of look in a bisection search type way to look for what the critical temperature is. That's one way to do it. You can also prove it mathematically. There's a way to prove that this is the critical temperature for icing. Um, but if I run the simulation at that critical temperature and then wait for a long time, so starting at time zero where everyone is random, and then time one, four, 32, 100, 
and a thousand like before, we eventually get to the scale invariant fractal type behavior where we still have islands of spins or magnetic domains that are mostly aligned in one direction. And if I could make a bigger version of this picture, no matter how far you zoomed in or out, there would still be islands of the same rough size that would continue to persist at all length scales because the critical icing model is a fractal just like a random walk, just like the Mandelbrot set, and just like the boiling water. Okay. So with that, if there are no other questions, I would like to conclude. All right, so thank you for your attention. I will stop. All right, sounds good. Stop the recording and then stop sharing.